Hi everyone, this is Devin Coombs and today I'm going to be talking about ASC 606. So a lot of people have asked me to cover this complex topic and so I figured I'd do an in-depth training on it and I'm looking into building a whole course for it right now. Uh, so I'm gonna, today I'm going to cover just an overview of some of the hot topics for ASC 606 and then throughout the rest of this video series I'm going to really dig into some of these key topics and problem areas and dig into the guidance and really train you on how to be able to interpret revenue recognition guidance, the new uh, revenue recognition guidance for some specific industries where it can get pretty complicated like software and SaaS and cloud industries. So what is ASC 606? ASC 606 is a new revenue recognition standard for revenue contracts with customers. So I say new, but this is really 2018 when this came out. I was at the cutting edge of this doing uh, revenue implementations for a lot of software companies in the Silicon Valley. And it has been very interesting to see how companies have implemented this because really the key here was how do we ensure that all companies are recognizing revenue in a consistent manner, manner so we can compare their financial statements. And it turned out with the old guidance, it was very explicit that every industry had different standards and uh, the FASB tried to conform the guidance with global standards with ASC 606. Um, so when we're thinking about this, I want us to really hone in on the two words, contracts and customers, because because that's really what we're focusing on here in 606 world or 606 land. So what do we mean by contracts? We mean something that's legally enforceable, that has commercial substance between a party purchasing something from us if we're the seller and if we're selling something useful to that party that has uh, that has real value that uh, that the customer can use and is in our ordinary operations and when we're saying customers we're saying s someone who's actually purchasing those goods right so a contract's the legal enforceable element but the customer is someone we'd normally do business with so if you and I are conducting a business together. Let's say I'm selling accounting services, but then I sell you my, I sell you my couch, right? If I normally am also selling you my cus, uh, selling you my accounting services, you're my customer, and I'm also selling you a couch. I mean, we'll have to discuss if that's an ordinary and or not ordinary activity. Probably it's not ordinary, but it's still you're my customer, and so that's something we'd have to look into. Well, let's say I I have my customers, but then I'm just selling. A friend, my couch. I, I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm not necessarily sell, selling my couch to a customer, right? If that's not my ordinary activity. Um, so, the, or if I'm if I'm selling it to, uh, if I'm leasing a, a my couch, right? Or if I'm leasing my services, or uh, or any other variety of of transactions. So we really have to define: like, Are you a customer, and do we have a contract? And if we have both of those, then we start exploring ASC 606. Before we get into this, uh, we have to explore all the other, what that means is we explore all the other guidance first. So is this a merger and acquisition transaction? Is this a lease? Is this a financing transaction or a non-cash non -cash transaction? If it's any of these, then we, we go into the other guidance. So I'm specifically going to be talking about ASC 606 here, the revenue recognition guidance. And throughout this course, I'm going to walk through these five steps, uh, the, the famous five-step process for ASC 606. And I'm going to go into explicit examples for each one of these and go into some of the guidance. But today's lecture is just what are the five steps? So the five steps are identify the contract. So what do we mean by identifying the contract? So first we determine if the contract has commercial substance. So am I going to gain something um, in exchange for what you're, uh, for Am I going to get cash in exchange for my sale, right? So if I'm giving you services or goods, are you going to give me cash? Are we each getting some kind of benefit? Um, if we aren't, right, if I'm just giving you something without cash, this isn't a really a legally enforceable contract. There's no commercial substance. Uh, is there probable collection? So if I'm selling you services, but I know you're not going to pay me, we don't really have a contract. So uh, collection actually, is, it's confused within the guidance here. A lot where we actually look into it later in the process of hey what's the transaction price of the contract but that's not where we should be looking at it first we look at it from the identify a contract perspective and if we can't collect anything 
then we don't have a contract. And then lastly, we're looking at legal rights and obligations. At the end of the day, is my contract legally enforceable? Could I sue you in case, uh, in case something goes wrong and you still owe me money and vice versa? If so, then we probably have a contract. Once we've established that we have a contract, we have to look into the performance co obligations underlying that contract. And so what do we mean by performance obligations? Oh, well, what are we actually selling? And that is actually a lot more complicated than you think. First, we have to look at is what is it what we're offering, the promise, what we're promising in the contract, distinct in the context of the contract, or capable of being distinct. And I, you can flip those around as well. So what I mean by capable of being distinct, like uh, the common example is a car. So if I'm selling you a car, there's a lot of aspects and components of that car, right? Like the wheels, the engine. Um, the seats, is each of the, are each of those a performance obligation? Should I allocate some kind of value to the wheels, to the seats, or I'm actually selling you the car? And so we go into these concepts of, it, is what I'm selling you transformative in nature? Like, is it more than the sum of the, its parts, or is it, or is it uh, additive in nature? And that's how we're really gonna determine if, hey, it's capable of being distinct and distinct in the context of the contract. So capable of being distinct, first we're gonna list out all of our promises and then distinct in the context of the contract, then we're going to really dig into, well, what what is my true, what is my true offering to the customer? The customer's perception also matters in this, in this regard. Once we've identified our performance obligations, then we will all, we'll determine the transaction price. So what is the price of our contract? So if I'm going to sell you, let's say I have a software and I, you promise to pay me $2 million for the next two years to have access to my software, um, we could say that transaction price of that contract is $2 million. Right? My performance obligation would be the software. Very simply, we can go into, there's more complexities there on how I'm delivering that software. But then determining the transaction price, like it would be that $2 million. Or would it? Well, we have to look into this concept of variable consideration. What if I, it turns out it's $2 million if I deliver everything or if certain penalties aren't incurred? Uh, or what if I have to pay you back some aspect of it if something goes wrong or if you request it? Um, if that's the case, then we, we have to adjust it for variable consideration and we take the most likely amount of variable consideration for the transaction price of the contract. Um, also, we have to consider non-cash consideration. So what if I sell you that $2 million of software and instead you give me stock or RSUs or what if you in exchange give me two million dollars of your software well we have to determine well is there commercial substance behind that transaction is there a good business justification for us to do that exchange also if it isn't then we're not even in 606 anymore because of the identify the contract aspect um, or if it is then what is the value of that non-cash consideration we have to make sure that's fairly valued so that we're not conducting you know fraud we're not selling products and not getting anything in exchange and then recognizing revenue and then what about consideration payable to a customer so what if i pay you two million dollars for your products and then you pay me that two million dollars back for my products well has anything actually happened happened in substance so we'll look at that consideration payable to a customer and adjust our consideration based off of the non-cash considerations or or the cash considerations of like, the business justification the fair value of what we're purchasing then we allocate the transaction price. So once we've determined, let's say it's state of flat 2 million, we're gonna allocate that a portion of that 2 million to each performance obligation. So that software, let's say I'm selling software and services, we're gonna have to determine the fair value of those software and services using a methodology called standalone selling price. So there's a, a whole process we'll go over in these lectures that talks about standalone selling price, how we determine it using observable inputs, and then uh, and then once we determine that, we use a theory of relative selling price analysis to allocate based off of standalone selling price to each of the performance obligations. Um, that way, if we were underselling one of our uh, performance obligations, it would still be allocated at fair value and, and uh, ultimately recorded correctly for financial statement disclosure. Lastly, we'll be recognizing revenue. So we use all of these theories then to determine the pattern of recogni revenue recognition, if it's over time or at a point in time. So if I have a software and I'm selling it to you and you have access to it, did you get access to the license on day one? 
do is there some kind of um, customer service aspect to it or is it a cloud a cloud software package where you get access to it um, on, on an as-needed basis uh, is, is it consumption based all of these considerations so you can see a, a, one contract can be quite complex and so the way that you would proceed with this is you would actually look at a, any contract you would have with a customer and do a, a process called contract review and then assess it under the lens of all of these components. And there's a lot we still didn't talk about here where there's termination for convenience language, language there's, uh, there's things like SLAs and, um, and acceptance language. There's a lot to cover here. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time trying to make quick and easy videos for you to digest this information uh, and hopefully you'll find it useful. So thank you for watching and expect a new video out at least every week on this topic. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.